Hello, my name is Leslie McCall, and I'm a professor of sociology and political science at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. I'm also the associate director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. Today, I will be talking about the multidimensional politics of inequality in the United States. I want to begin with what I believe is the main proposition underlying most academic research on the politics of inequality. And here I'm talking about academic research across the social sciences disciplines in sociology as well as in economics, political science, and psychology. This proposition also underlies, I think, most elite political discourse on inequality, although that has been steadily changing over the past five years, uh, which I will come back to later in the talk. So the proposition goes something like this. Americans believe that everyone has an equal chance to rise through hard work, and as a result, individuals are responsible for their own destinies, market outcomes are fair, and government redistribution is unnecessary. It's possible to evaluate this set of ideas through data. My talk is gonna be using the best available data to evaluate this claim. But before I get into the data, I want to raise a couple of points that help to frame the following presentation. The first is that there's a lot packed into this short statement. Elements of it refer to American dream ideology, the idea that everyone has an equal chance to rise to hard work, other elements of it refer to free market ideology, such that market outcomes are fair, uh, and that this implies that profit maximization is the only motivation in the market and that we can't be concerned about social equity within the market. The idea that government redistribution is unnecessary is seen as a peculiarly American phenomenon, so this set of ideas also falls under the rubric of American exceptionalism. And I'm gonna be referring to each of these elements throughout my talk as I use data to try to assess each of these elements of this statement. Uh, the second point to keep in mind is that uh, the reason why there's so much research on this particular statement is because if it's true, and it's widely held to believe to be true, then it furnishes one of the primary explanations, or at least political explanations, of high levels of inequality in the US. And that is, that's what Americans want. They tolerate high levels of inequality because they believe that there is free economic um, open, uh, equal economic opportunity in the country. Uh, I hope to provide evidence for a positive alternative political explanation of high levels of inequality in the US by the end of this talk. You can return to this slide later. I'm gonna go over it very quickly. It provides information about uh, the data that I'll be using, the methods, and some cautions about interpretation of data. I'm gonna be relying primarily on public opinion data uh, there are problems with public opinion data. It's not the be all and end all, uh, but I believe it provides the best available evidence of American views on these issues. So let's jump right in to uh, preferences for explicit government redistribution. This is seen, these preferences are seen as the primary indicator of preferences about inequality. And the reason for that is because uh, it involves, uh, redistribution involves costs. It involves raising taxes uh, that then are used to uh, redistribute income from the rich to the poor. And if people aren't willing um, to uh, endorse those kinds of costs, societal costs, uh, then that must mean that they don't care particularly strongly about the issue of economic inequality. This graph shows uh, American responses to uh, a question about government redistribution, uh, as well as responses from individuals in other countries. The US response is in blue, the median for peer countries, so-called rich democracies is in red. Uh, and the question that's asked is about government's responsibility to reduce the gap between high and low incomes. We see that 35% of Americans strongly agree or agree to this statement, whereas the median uh, across peer countries is close to 60%. These data uh, are from the year 2000, which seems kind of old, um, but the reason for that is because it's the uh, last year in which uh, Canada participated in the survey, the International Social Survey Program, um, and Canada is often seen as the country that's most comparable to the US, so it's important to include in this comparative analysis. Uh, but things really haven't changed that much according to other data sources in terms of the US's standing as sort of exceptionalist uh, in this regard uh, with very low levels of support for government redistribution. Another piece of evidence also used uh, to um, uh, support the American exceptionalist proposition is that uh, support for 
redistribution uh, from the rich to the poor hasn't increased over time during the period in which inequality has risen sharply in the US. And other presentations associated with this workshop will demonstrate that increase in inequality over time. Here we see a flat pattern uh, over time uh, and no increase uh, in, in desires for more redistribution from the rich to the poor. We also see that uh, levels of support for redistribution are higher among Blacks uh, and, and among some other groups, low-income groups, for example, Democrats. Um, but for those groups, too, we see a flat trend over time. Why, then, hasn't, uh, hasn't support for redistribution increased over time as inequality has increased if Americans really do uh, desire less inequality? That's what guides this research, uh, the research that I'm talking about on this American exceptionalist kind of American dream proposition. I am going to uh, evaluate alternative uh, explanations uh, that attempt to answer that question uh, about American perceptions of inequality without reference to government policies, uh, as well as American perceptions of economic opportunity, again, without reference to government policies. And then I will return towards the end of the talk to examine American preferences about other kinds of government policies that do enjoy very high uh, support. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about preferences directly about inequality without reference to government policies. Here is a question uh, that's widely used to assess uh, opposition to inequality. The question asks whether income differences are too large in the particular country in which the survey is asked. Here again, we have the cross-national evidence. Uh, in red, uh, the median for peer countries. In blue, the US, and in green, Canada. And here you see that the US is not an extreme outlier. Uh, in terms of this opposition to uh, uh, inequality. Here we see bars for strongly agree and agree to the statement that income differences are too large. And about two thirds of Americans believe that income differences are, are too large. That is, they strongly agree or agree to the statement. That's a little bit below the median, but not certainly not an extreme outlier uh, and a little bit below the preferences uh, in Canada. Looking over time in the US, uh, I've assembled here some public opinion polls that ask about uh, perceptions of whether or not executives are underpaid, overpaid, or uh, make about the right amount of money. Uh, there are other data, not a lot actually, there are other data that I can use uh, to examine over time preferences for pay and pay equality. But what's nice about these polls is that they're worded roughly similarly and they began in the 1970s. We have polls in 80, in 1984, 92, going up to the 2000s. And what you see consistently over time is very high perceptions that executives are paid too much. They're overpaid, uh, ranging anywhere from two thirds uh, to three quarters or more of Americans who believe that executives are overpaid and thus that uh, the pay structure is uh, too unequal. Now let's turn to uh, preferences directly about economic opportunity, uh, often measured as social mobility, optimism about rising economically above one's current standard of living. Again, without reference to government policies that we'll come back to later. Uh, we're gonna start with trends over time. This is a question from the General Social Survey, and it asks, the way things are in America, people like me and my family have a good chance of improving our standard of living. The red line, shows agreement and strong agreement to this question. You see it's quite high. Uh, most people do believe when you're, when you're asked uh, individuals about their own sense of, of um, opportunity, then they tend to be uh, more optimistic than if you ask them about other people's uh, opportunities, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so we have high levels of agreement um, to this question, but what you see is a peak in the year 2000 and steady decline from the, from the year 2000. Uh, uh, to the present. Um, the last time point in 2018, you see a little bit of an uptick between 2016 and 2018, which I will come to in a moment. But first, uh, I, I just want to underscore that, um, that one of the aspects of the American Exceptions or American Dream proposition is that it's unchanging. It's an unchanging core uh, belief or norm um, among Americans uh, that is kind of timeless. This suggests that it isn't timeless, that people's beliefs or optimism about economic opportunities shift over time and they've become increasingly pessimistic uh, since the year 2000. Why now this uptick? 
in 2016, is everyone becoming more optimistic? This chart uh, graphs responses to that question broken down uh, by race and ethnicity, uh, Latinx individuals in red, uh, blacks in blue, and whites in gray. And you can see that the major uptick has occurred among whites from 2016 to 2018, uh, perhaps as a result of the election of Donald Trump, who has put forward a pro-white economic nationalist agenda. That is a speculation, but I think it's, it's potentially a, a plausible one. Um, overall, though, you see that there is a decline among all racial and ethnic groups in their optimism about upward mobility. One other point I'd like to mention in this slide is that you also see an increase in optimism among Blacks from 2008 to 2010. That is perhaps a result of the election of President Obama, um, but thereafter, you have a decline in optimism, perhaps again speculating here as a result of unmet expectations um, of his presidency increasing racial equality. Now let's look at how people think about uh, the opportunities that particular groups have. Um, what is their perception, for example, about the opportunities that uh, Blacks and Latinx individuals have, that whites have, that men, that women, that people from high-income groups and low-income groups have. Uh, according to American Dream Ideology, everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed, to get ahead. Um, that is a level playing field. However, what we found in this study is that uh, people perceive high-income people here on the left of the graph to have much uh, greater advantages in getting ahead than people at, uh, from lower income families who have much lower uh, opportunities to get ahead. And in between, we have a pretty clear gradient going from what we would recognize as more advantaged groups from upper income to men have high advantages, whites, uh, Asian Americans. Uh, there's some research on this, I, I won't get into the details there, that fall kind of in the gap between groups that are perceived to be advantaged and those that are perceived to be disadvantaged. Uh, to women, to Blacks, to Hispanics, uh, to low-income individuals. So uh, we think fairly clear evidence that uh, there aren't perceptions that everyone has an equal chance, a level playing field to get ahead, regardless of one's class background, one's gender, or one's racial and ethnic background. Now turning to the cross-national evidence, uh, these are data that ask uh, about the factors that are important in getting ahead. And on the left, you see hard work as the factor uh, that is graphed here. And blue, again, is the US. Red is the median uh, for peer countries. Gray is the response for uh, high-income individuals, the top 1% in the US. And this is based on a survey by Benjamin Page and his colleagues, a representative survey of top wealth and income holders in uh, Chicago. So according to the American exceptionalist uh, proposition that I started off with, Americans believe that hard work is all that's necessary to get ahead. And these bars on the left do suggest that that is true. Americans are unusual. 96% of them believe that hard work is essential, very important uh, in getting ahead versus 73% of individuals in other countries. However, uh, when we turn to the uh, three other questions that ask about more structural barriers to getting ahead, uh, uh, the education of one's parents, coming from a wealthy family, or knowing the right people, what we find, perhaps surprisingly, is that Americans are actually more likely to perceive structural barriers to getting ahead, these particular structural barriers to getting ahead, uh, more than in other countries, peer countries, and much more than those uh, in the top 1%, even though it's often claimed that the public at large thinks or adopts the attitudes of the rich because they think that they themselves are going to be rich someday. This clearly these data clearly uh, do not support uh, that notion. The next two slides I'm, I'm going to skip over, but uh, I just want to refer you to these two different studies uh, that, that examine the extent to which people have accurate information about the extent or the degree of, of social mobility in the United States and relative to other countries. Uh, and I invite you to evaluate the evidence in these two studies. In this study, uh, the finding is that um, Americans uh, overestimate the amount of upward mobility from the bottom to the top. However, this study using what I believe is more comprehensive methods, but only focusing on the US, uh, finds that Americans actually underestimate the extent of upward mobility uh, and also um, underestimate the extent to which 
people at the top uh, move down from the top. That is, there's much greater stickiness in perceptions um, of the occupational and income distribution. So rich and poor children are perceived to stay in place as adults much more than actually in reality. And this is a pessimistic view. Uh, but I invite you to look at these studies and evaluate them uh, yourselves uh, in greater detail. All right, now let's move to the relationship between perceptions of economic inequality and perceptions of economic opportunity. Let's join these two issues together. How do people think about them um, as, uh, as a package? Uh, what my colleagues and I uh, have done is try to develop a model of beliefs about inequality and redistribution that's rooted in beliefs about economic opportunity. And briefly, uh, the model goes something like this, that rising and high levels of inequality are salient to people when they're perceived as restricting economic opportunity. That is when they're perceived as, when high levels of income inequality are, are perceived as structural barriers uh, to opportunity. As a result of that, uh, people who do perceive these structural barriers to upward, up, uh, upward mobility uh, and economic opportunity as a result of high levels of inequality uh, will support policies that expand labor market equality and opportunity and expand educational opportunity as well. Uh, what we did uh, to test this, um, this model is we provided people with some information about rising inequality, strict factual information, nothing fancy here at all, a brief description of uh, the trend in income inequality uh, over time in the US. And then we asked them questions about their opportunity beliefs, the same questions that I've showed you earlier about the extent to which coming from a wealthy family or having highly educated parents affects one's opportunities to get ahead. And what we find is that when people are exposed to this information, what, what we think is making the issue of economic inequality salient to them, not necessarily giving them information, but making it salient, uh, they're more likely to, uh, to have structural views about factors that are important uh, in fostering economic opportunity. That's in the black bar, that's the treatment. Uh, that's the information about inequality versus the gray bar, which is the control group. That, that has information um, about baseball statistics, comparable material, but uh, unrelated to inequality. So people are more likely to think in a structural way about barriers for getting ahead when the information about economic inequality is made salient to them. They're less likely to think um, that individual factors are important uh, when given this information. Now, this is the opposite of what many um, assume happens with inequality, which is that uh, high levels of inequality motivate people uh, to uh, work harder uh, so that they can achieve the riches at the top of the distribution. Um, and in that way, inequality is self-reinforcing. Uh, that is another element of the proposition that I started off uh, with at the beginning of this talk. Uh, but we do not see evidence for that. We see evidence that inequality, making inequality salient, makes people think in a more structuralist way. Um, now let me turn to the, uh, to the more recent period uh, and uh, discuss structural uh, barriers to uh, reducing racial inequality or success, uh, economic success among uh, racial minorities, African Americans in particular, I'm gonna focus on here. Um, and I wanna begin with this uh, quotation from someone who uh, spoke at a, at a protest recently, a Black Lives Matter protest in Manhattan, and then was quoted in an article in The New Yorker. And uh, she said, um, but finally you see a lot of people paying attention, maybe because there's less distraction. It took a pandemic for people to finally focus on this one fact, Black Lives Matter. Now, I would suggest that what she's suggesting in that statement, um, of course, no one, uh, no one can ever uh, say for sure what exactly uh, has sparked the protests at this particular moment. Um, but what she's suggesting is that there has been an increase in salience in the issue of uh, inequality between African Americans and whites specifically, and therefore an increased focus on uh, structural barriers uh, to economic success and opportunity uh, for African Americans. Now, what's interesting is when we look at data to try to analyze uh, whether or not there has been such a shift towards more structural perceptions of racial inequality, we find an interesting pattern uh, in which uh, increased perceptions of structural uh, factors um, that underlie racial inequality actually occurred, an increase in structural perceptions actually occurred prior uh, to this, um, the recent wave of protests 
uh, in response to the killing of George Floyd and to the coronavirus. Uh, so the first line here shows uh, responses to questions about whether discrimination um, is an important factor uh, in explaining black-white inequality. And in the year 2000, the share of uh, all respondents saying that it was uh, an important factor was 37%. Another structural factor is the lack of equal education. Uh, and 45% of indi individuals said um, that that was an important factor. Now jump to 2008 and 2000, uh, through 2014, um, between 2008 and 2014, I'm averaging these responses here. Uh, and this is during the period in which um, President Obama's administration um, uh, was in, in, in place. And we see a slight decline, small, but from 37 to 35%. Perhaps uh, uh, an indication that President Obama himself represented uh, a decline in the structural racism, structural factors that affect racial inequality. But then when we go to the Trump uh, period, uh, President Trump's um, administration between 2016 and 2018, again, before the current period, uh, we see an increase to 44% uh, of the sample saying that dis discrimination is an important part, and then an increase also in those who say that the lack of equal education is an important factor, again, a structural factor. So an increase over time before the current period, perhaps having to do with these two very different administrations and their very different signals and cues and policies related to inequality and racial inequality specifically are affecting perceptions, making those perceptions more uh, making the information and these dynamics more uh, salient. Uh, we also see the same patterns, I just wanna note here for white non-Hispanics without a college degree, increasing from 30% in 2000 to 35% saying that uh, discrimination is, is an important factor um, during the most recent period, 2016 to 2018, and 38% to 44% for lack of equal education uh, for Black non-Hispanics without a college degree, we also see an, an increase over time from 59 to 62 percent for discrimination as a factor, and 54 uh, percent that has actually stayed steady. But note that there was a decline during the Obama era among Blacks um, in, in their perception that discrimination uh, and uh, lack of equal education was a problem. Now let's jump to the current period and look at public opinion polls. Um, from 2020, but also compare them to earlier periods. Uh, uh, public opinion polls on police killings of blacks. To what extent is this a broader problem that is a structural explanation versus an isolated incident? And you see in 2014, those who said that police killings of blacks were a broader problem gave a structural explanation of 43% um, of the sample. That actually increased to 60% in 2016. Uh, perhaps as, as a result of uh, the visibility uh, and the protests that were uh, sponsored by the Black Lives Move, uh, Matter movement um, and the very uh, high profile unfortunate uh, killings of Trayvon Martin, uh, Eric Garner, um, Sandra Bland, um, and uh, Michael Brown. Uh, so we, we see the increase again already in 2016, pretty substantial increase uh, in having a structural view about uh, the police killings of Blacks. Um, and it rose further in June of 2020, post-protests and post-killing of George Floyd, as well as Breonna Taylor, um, up to 69%. Um, and of course, a decline in those saying that it's just an isolated, these are just isolated incidents. Support for Black Lives Matter also increased from 2017 to 37, from 37% to 2019 to 41%, but has increased uh, dramatically uh, to 53% uh, in June 2020. The protests also uh, have received uh, positive support. In one poll uh, on June 1st, 54% thought that the protesters were justified, uh, and on June uh, 7th, um, there was a strong or somewhat support for the protests at 74%. So here we're going to look at policies, uh, mostly um, for government to uh, expand economic opportunity, uh, by which, again, I mean to expand educational opportunity as well as labor market opportunities. So if we look at uh, this one um, question about uh, from the General Social Survey, uh, the same survey that uh, has the data about um, 
uh, support for government redistribution, which actually I'm going to repeat here, show here. That's the line that I showed at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, that's the relatively low and unchanging level of uh, support for government redistribution from the rich to the poor, which most of the literature focuses on. But if we look at this alternative measure of support for increasing government spending on education, you see an increase in support in the spending on education in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, uh, and then leveling off at a very high level of support for education spending. So clearly, not all government policies are opposed, and there isn't across the board opposition to government action on policies that uh, could affect levels of economic inequality and educational inequality. Uh, and the next two slides provide some anecdotal evidence. I'll, I'll go over them relatively quickly. At the state level, there have been a number of ballot measures that are specifically targeted towards increasing taxes on high income individuals, the so-called millionaire taxes. Uh, and the revenues uh, are, uh, are to be applied to very specific and popular equality and opportunity enhancing policies such as education, healthcare, and uh, public safety, uh, which uh, recently uh, during the protests have now come under uh, attack. Um, I would like to go into uh, that issue, but uh, don't have time right, right here, right now. Um, okay, so we see these ballot measures. Of course, not all of them at the states at the state level are passing, but uh, a large share of them are, at least half of them are passing, uh, where you see uh, this exchange um, between uh, targeting high income groups with higher taxes. Um, and using those revenues to support popular opportunity enhancing policies. There's also a lot of anecdotal evidence to support um, the idea that, that people uh, really can get behind um, uh, policies and campaigns that expand labor market opportunities. So here I'll focus on the, um, the elements in blue, things like uh, campaigns to raise the minimum wage, up to a living wage, anti-wage theft campaigns, uh, the fight for 15, a $15 minimum wage that began uh, with the fast food worker strikes uh, for higher pay uh, in 2012, that, it's, that was itself in part uh, motivated by the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. Uh, the recent protests uh, against Amazon and meat processing plants uh, for unsafe working conditions during the pandemic, I think also falls uh, generally under this rubric of the need to regulate the labor market and improve the working conditions uh, of individuals. Um, other campaigns have been very popular, things like predictable scheduling campaigns, uh, paid family leave campaigns, ban the box, which is the ban the box uh, that asks about a prior criminal record on, um, on hiring applications. This is a, uh, a study from 2010 uh, that I want to highlight because it focuses on uh, support for various kinds of government regulation uh, that would uh, create stricter labor standards in the workplace. Uh, and we see this question that, that asks about government um, has various labor standards um, to protect worker rights. How important do you think each of these are? And the percent that say that these standards are very important is highest for workplace safety regulations and very important uh, during the um, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, also, 78% say that family and, and maternity leave uh, are important government regulations. The minimum wage, 70%, and so on. This next slide uh, focuses specifically on support for paid sick leave, which again uh, was brought to uh, the nation's attention during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, going back to 2010, I have found uh, public opinion polls that show very high support for uh, a government mandate that employers must provide for paid sick leave, as well as paid family medical leave to take care of sick uh, family members. Let's now move very specifically into uh, examining uh, uh, the so-called free market beliefs of Americans. The fact that Americans support in such high numbers government regulation uh, of, the, of the market, of the workplace, suggests that they don't believe in a pure form of free market ideology in which the only consideration is profit maximization and that there are no other considerations having to do with workplace conditions or other uh, uh, issues related to equity and opportunity. 
we tried to test to see uh, whether or not people believe in this pure form of market ideology by replicating the question about government redistribution. That's at the top of the slide. Uh, we created a parallel a uh, question that asked about redistribution from uh, people with high pay to people with low pay, such as executives, reducing executive pay and increasing unskilled worker pay. This is a, a survey that was fielded uh, on the GSS um, and the ISSP in 2014. And uh, in the first row, we have the response that I have referred to in, in a few prior slides. 47% uh, of Americans believe government is responsible for this. But when we asked about whether major companies are responsible for reducing pay disparities, we found 56% uh, in favor of this. And more importantly, when we looked at whether people believed in either government or major companies as being responsible for reducing income or pay inequality, fully two thirds uh, of Americans supported one or the other form of redistribution. So this gives you a very different um, per, uh, uh, portrait of support for uh, various forms of uh, redistribution in pay or in income. Now, let's talk uh, more directly about uh, beliefs about government because one uh, implication, uh, although it's often stated very explicitly um, of the proposition that I started off uh, with at the beginning, um, is that American exceptionalism also entails that uh, people are distrustful of the government, that they, uh, that they do not support government action on most uh, issues um, that, again, this is a core unchanging belief among Americans that they're opposed to government action. Now, clearly, all of, all of the, um, the uh, data that I presented so far on various forms of labor standards and government regulation, uh, policies that would enhance um, uh, spending, increased spending on education, and so on, uh, do not suggest that, that this anti-government stance is something that um, applies across the board. But let's look at some uh, data from the current period during the coronavirus pandemic, from Data for Progress. They have been polling individuals on a number of questions uh, from mid-April to uh, mid-June. There are eight waves of the data. And the question that I pulled out here has to do with uh, positive, negative, and neutral views of state government versus federal government. And what you see here are very different views uh, of state government versus federal government, much higher positive views of state government than a federal government, uh, of course, much lower than views, uh, negative views of state government relative to federal government. Uh, many other scholars have found a similar kind of pattern uh, in, in, in prior research. Um, and the explanation that many give for this difference is that people can see the benefits of policies enacted at the state level and also many other, many more um, policies are enacted uh, at the state level than at the federal level. Things like, for example, raising the minimum wage has now taken place um, at the state level and at the local level because the federal government has not taken action on that uh, issue since uh, 2009. So it's been 11 years since the federal minimum wage has increased. So um, more action uh, that people desire in the minimum wage is something that's very, very popular among uh, conservatives as well as liberals and moderates. Um, more action is taken at the state and local level and thus uh, uh, more individuals are supportive um, of, of government at the state level than supportive of the federal government. Finally, uh, this is the last slide uh, that I'll discuss, um, and this shows uh, a kind of more um, general uh, uh, indication of individuals' perceptions about government in terms of their responsiveness to their needs. To what extent do people feel like they are politically efficacious is, is the way academics um, refer to it. Um, and the question asks whether government is responsive again to one's uh, concerns. and here we have this data uh, broken down by occupation uh, and for, again, a number of peer countries. Um, and the U.S. is sort of just to the left of center on this graph. Uh, those in the red square are manual workers. Those in the uh, orange triangle are service workers. I'll collectively refer to these as working class groups. And you see that working class groups in the U.S. have a very low level of uh, political efficacy, very low level, sen uh, level sense of the government's responsiveness to their needs um, and their interests. Uh, about It is the lowest cross-nationally, but on par with other countries that, that have low levels of um, political efficacy among the working class, such as Belgium uh, and Ireland. 
this uh, lack of political efficacy, I think, is what is at the root uh, of potential political inaction or what looks like political apathy, um, lack of political participation uh, in voting. Um, the U.S. is also well known as part of the exceptionalist proposition for having relatively low voter turnout, um, uh, roughly in, in presidential elections, uh, uh, at, at best around 60 percent uh, of the electorate. Ayanna Presley, uh, a new member of the House of Representatives beginning in 2019, said people don't participate not because they're ignorant and they don't know enough, it's because they know too much. They live it every day. So I've tried to uh, question the, the proposition of American exceptionalism with data, showing that it's inconsistent with public positions on multiple issues related to inequality, opportunity, and government policy. I've also now <laughs> tried to offer, um, am going to try to offer uh, an alternative or additional reason for inequality that's political in nature. And that was suggested by uh, Ayanna Presley's statement. And that's the failure of political institutions uh, to represent the public interest. Uh, by political institutions, I mean Congress, the Electoral College, the Supreme Court, the media, doesn't enact these policies uh, Americans uh, support uh, in very large numbers. This failure is also longstanding. I've provided time series evidence to show that support for these policies is not just a recent phenomenon, but, but is longstanding. Um, and that perhaps this longstanding and deep-seated uh, failure of political institutions to represent the public is what has spawned multiple protest movements over the past decade. I've been able to spend less time on this, but uh, uh, in my work, I try to propose a multidimensional framework for understanding public views of inequality that's rooted in desires for substantive economic and educational opportunity, which would require a broad set of civil rights, employment protections and support, and the redistribution of pay, not just the redistribution of post-tax and post-transfer income. Um, and all of these types of policies tend to be very, very popular. Thank you very much.